Hey everybody, welcome to week three of the Karen Dean Show. I am really excited to be here. Uh, I just realized this week that I haven't really told you much about me, so I wanna do an introduction for myself first. Um, I am a resiliency coach. I came across that title through a whole lot of really horrible situations, and I decided those situations were meant to do something better. So I decided that I wanted to help other women who are going through difficult situations with their decisions and try to help them live their best life. Before all that, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I was recognized by RBC Canadian Women Entrepreneur Awards as a nominee in 2014. I've been mentored by the amazing Arlene Dickinson, who you may know from Dragon's Den. And I have done a whole lot of amazing volunteer work uh, right now through my company, which is called Country Fied Clothing. I have started a website called StrongerNS.com. I launched it two months ago tonight to raise money for the Stronger Together Nova Scotia Fund, which helps the families of the victims of the horrible mass shooting that happened in Nova Scotia um, just over two months ago in the middle of April. To date, two months in, I have raised $90,000 for that fund by selling these really awesome Nova Scotia Strong shirts. We have t-shirts, we have tank tops for women, and we have hoodies. So if anybody would like to support that cause, the website again is strongerns.com. And we would really appreciate your support. My goal is to raise $100,000 for the fund and I am almost there. If any of you are interested in the messaging that you hear tonight, uh, you can find more about me on KarenDeanSpeaks.com, which is on your screen. Um, that is my page for my coaching. I have a program called the Resilience Reboot, and we will be doing the next version of that around the end of July. I haven't picked an exact date yet, but if you sign up for my emails, you will definitely get informed of when that's going to happen. And um, I would love to have you in the program. I'm also a single mom to three amazing humans. Um, that two of them are young adults now. One of them is only a little 12 year old girl. If you were here the first week, you got to meet her. And with my kids, we have been through so many challenges. Um, two of them were very sick. Uh, we've been through two divorces. We've been through abusive relationships, um, which led to those divorces. Um, so we've been through so much as a family. And I think that uh, through my own experience, I have so many valuable messages to share with women all over the planet. So on that note, my guest tonight is another fierce, amazing woman. Her name is Anne-Marie Flynn. And I'm just gonna read a little intro about her and kind of what we're gonna talk about tonight. The greatest gift we can give our relationships is to be vulnerable. And that means talking about fear with courage versus shame. Being able to talk about our fears is a key step to being open and authentically connected. It's also the pivot point to shifting mindset to one of feeling you have to be fearless to one of fearing less, which we're gonna talk about quite a bit tonight. Sharing fear and vulnerability is a direct invitation to the other person to share their own fears, whether it's a parent and child, educator and student, executive or staff and staff relationship. When you talk about your fear, you're creating an opportunity to take your relationship and leadership to a place where real engagement, connection, safety, learning and well-being occurs. My guest tonight, Anne-Marie Flynn, is a business performance consultant. She works with many people to help them fear less and to run their organizations and be amazing. So without further ado, we're gonna join, we're gonna have Anne-Marie Flynn come in and we're going to share some stories about facing fear and where success and failures are both gifts and mindset shifting is so important to making your future endeavors be everything you ever dreamed of. Welcome, Emory. Thank you so much. What a wow, that was such a wonderful introduction. For a wonderful person. I'm really <laughs> glad to have you here tonight. 
And, and I was saying you have a very it. nice shirt. Yes, we're twinning tonight. I love it. Thank you for your support of that fundraiser. And thank you for wearing it tonight. And I want to thank the people who are commenting tonight. Um, I'm really grateful for all the support that I've had for that fundraiser. And it just warms my heart to be able to help the victims of that tragedy in some small way. Um, a yeah. hundred thousand dollars isn't a lot of money when it comes to what they're going to need, but for mm -hmm. a little home-based business, um, running out of my garage, I think it's a pretty big deal. So, yeah, and to, I have to say, I have to say too, Karen, that you know one of the things that I love that you're doing is you are a local businesswoman that you're supporting local as well, and you're sharing that and giving it back and bring and paying it forward to so many local organizations and businesses in Nova Scotia, and and also bringing the message of Nova Scotia strong around the world, which is something that I think there's a strong message there as well. Just you know, to show, I mean, you are the epitome of resiliency and, you know, bouncing back. And I would even say bouncing forward from so much adversity. And so it's certainly something to be admired. Thank you. And on that note, I just want to say to anybody watching, we do ship internationally because we have shipped to New Zealand. We ship to the UK. We ship to Germany and all over the U.S. and every province and territory in Canada. So it really goes to show that Nova Scotia is loved everywhere and that you know we know Scotians are spread out all over the world so we really have a lot to be proud of absolutely for sure um i want to start um with the story that you told about joining the naval reserves yes when you were i think 17 is that correct and how you had to face some fears the story that just you told a few a few, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to start with that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I, I use this story a lot when I'm doing keynotes and motivational speaking, and it really does touch uh, the hearts and um, the lives of so many other people where they kind of go, gosh, yeah, I know what you're feeling. And so to give you, uh, just to go back and give you a little bit of background. So when I was 17 years old, I joined the Naval Reserves and I just thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to, uh, my thoughts were I was gonna you know, experience travel and adventure. And what I ended up having was this really mundane and very boring uh, paper pushing job. And uh, certainly wasn't um, aspiring to what I was hoping to aspire to. And then when I was 21, I saw a posting for a job to become a military scuba diver. And I was thinking, fantastic, I was going to be able to travel the world. And as I mentioned in my other talks, I was going to kind of swim with the dolphins. And all I could see was all of these scenes in Finding Nemo. And that was what I was going to see under the water. And so I decided to sign up. And what I realized uh, after I signed up, actually, is that if I um, if I completed this course, I would become Atlantic Canada's very first female military scuba diver. And so that was the hook. That was like, OK, so now I have what I call a plan A and all answers come back to plan A. And so I thought if I can become Atlantic Canada's very first female military scuba diver and swim with the dolphins and find Nemo, then it's going to be, you know, life's going to be wonderful. What I didn't tell them when I took this, when I signed up for the course, is that I'm really claustrophobic and I'm, I'm really not a big fan of the water. And I just thought, you know, I'm 21. I mean, <laughs> what's going to, what's going to, that can't be a big problem, right? Right. So I, so I was like, okay, I'll just sign up. I get to go out west and and travel and and everything. So that was my my ambition to take this course. And again, like I said, to become Atlantic Canada's very first female military scuba diver. Um, do you want me to keep going and tell you the rest? Oh, keep yeah. Going. Yeah. Because okay. It gets better. I it like gets the better. next part. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> and this is where so we talk about fearing less. Right, exactly. And this is where we get to it. And so what I what I realized um, before you actually go on to the course, you have to go run through all these exercises um, to sh make sure that you're mentally and physically capable of of going through into this course. So that one of the first exercises that I had to do was I had to go into this decompression chamber. 
And if anybody has ever seen one, it looks like a little furnace tank, just kind of fatter and thicker with these little tiny portholes that you can hardly see through. And this little tiny door that you kind of squeeze into and then they turn the, you know, the, uh, the door shut. And so it was a three man decompression chamber. And what they decided to do was put five of us in there. And so there was four men. Can I just say right now, like you make me nauseous just listening <laughs> yeah. to this. Well, I have to say that even now my heart still pounds when I think about right. this. So four men all over the all over six feet tall and me, and I'm just under five four. And so all I thought about was like, oh my gosh, like the, you know, the palms are getting sweaty and I'm hyperventilating and you know, getting really quiet. And I was letting everybody else go through first. And so finally the the instructor said, you know, you got to go in there. And I was trying to get in and then I would get out. I would try to go in and I kept doing this about three or four times until the instructor said Moffat, which is my maiden name. They said, Moffat, are you claustrophobic? Are you claustrophobic? Because if you are, you can't take this course. And then I thought about it and it really came down to what is my plan A? So not taking this course would be plan B. And I thought, if I don't have a plan B and simply follow plan A, I have no choice. So I have a plan A to become Atlantic Canada's very first female military scuba diver. So I have no choice. I have to go in. So in I go. And I say this like, I don't know who that poor man's hand, uh, who that poor man was. I held this poor man's hand. I swear I crushed it when I was in there, but it certainly helped me to get through that. So I ran through all of these exercises and finally got accepted to go on to the course. So then I get into the course. So two weeks into the course, and it's an eight week long course, um, they, uh, they again run you through a whole bunch of exercises. You don't wear flippers for the first two weeks of the course. You wear 10 pound lead boots. Wow. And that's simply to keep you on the bottom of the ocean. You're running through all of these exercises of welding and, you know, doing a bunch of crazy stuff. So anyway, so I was, you know, had the 10 pound lead boots on. And then the, one of the exercises that we had to do was a simulated night dive. So what you do is you've got 10 pound lead boots and gun tape over your mask. And then heck, you're just going to go in down the water, down into the ocean you go. And again, sure enough, there goes, you know, I'm hyperventilating, thinking about claustrophobia, thinking about all these terrible things that are, that's going to touch me when I'm in the water. And I go down the ladder, I come up, down the ladder, and I come up. And again, three or four times until finally the instructor said, Moffat, if you come up that ladder one more time, you're off the course. And that's mm -hmm. when it hit me. And this is where we talk about fearing less. And I thought, they are not going to wait until I'm 100% fearless. No one's gonna wait until I'm 100% fearless to go down into that water. And so I can't wait till I'm 100% fearless to go down into the water because it's never gonna happen. Right. And so what I thought was, you know, instead of being fearless, I need to learn to fear it less. In other words, there's nothing, it, it, you know, we all have fear within us and that is a natural part of life our our head our bodies are are set up to look for danger or what i call false education that appears real um which is the acronym for fear mm -hmm. and so the body and the mind especially the mind starts to think okay there's 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 a there's a danger here and that's why this fear shows up so we're smarter than that. We know that that's not going to be the case. So how do we create an environment where it's like, you know, it's okay. I know that this is scary and I'm going to do it anyway. And that's where we get into, you know, instead of saying I'm claustrophobic, I don't really like the water. Um, sorry, I, I want to become Atlanta Canada's very first female military scuba diver, but I'm claustrophobic and I don't want you know, don't like the water, how do I switch that up to say, okay, I'm acknowledging that I'm not a big fan of the water. I'm acknowledging that I'm claustrophobic and I have a plan A, that's to become Atlantic Fair, Canada's very first female military scuba diver. And that's what I mean about, that's, you know, it's just about fearing less. Hmm. Um, so anyway, I've ended up going down, got through that part of the course until the, um, it was again, another two weeks after the, after that, where we actually got out into our very first open night dive. 
And I just remember it was midnight. It was a very calm night. There was like no ripples on the water. There was no moon, there was no stars. It was just a very black, black evening. So there wasn't very much to see. And we started to go out and we were probably about 500 meters out or whatever. And I realized that I left my weight belt on the jetty. So there's 25 of us on this course. So instead of them you know, turning the boat around just for me, they said, okay, Moffat, jump into the water, swim back by yourself, get the weight belt and get back here in 10 minutes or whatever it was, I can't even remember. So this is why I remembered why I'm not a big fan of the water because I have two older brothers Anybody out there that has older siblings can probably relate to this and how they love to tease and torment the, the, the youngest in the family. Okay. And so anytime I, I touched a body of water, whether it was an ocean, a lake, a stream, even a bathtub, for goodness sakes, they would start to do this. And my oldest brother actually one time pulled me under because he's he could hold his breath for I don't know how long anyway he ended up pulling me under one time just to kind of he thought it was quite hilarious um so anyway so of course what was going through my mind when I was swimming back by myself was this song was just going through my <laughs> head over and over and over again and where and is exactly if and then I saw a seal we saw a seal that day and it was sort of swimming around us and being really curious while we were doing our exercise and that if that freaking seal shows pops his head up now. I'm going to be touches running leg. on the water. Yeah, <laughs> touches my leg. I'm going to be running back to <laughs> on the water. So anyway, and I got back to the to the jetty and I went, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I can continue doing this. Like, this is this is crazy. And then I thought about it. And I thought, you know, if my if my imagination can create fear, it can also destroy fear. And so again, how do I switch that fearing less and how do I switch to yes and and it's as crazy as it sounds and I'm I as I said in my last talk it's not like I'm really proud to tell anybody this but I changed the Jaws theme song to the Smurfs theme song <laughs> and that was the only way I got back to swimming by myself back in the water back to the boat so yes the Smurfs yes, that was the before day. the Nemo days that was before, before the, the Nemo day. day. Yes, exactly. And just keep swimming. <laughs> just keep swimming. I know. I so <laughs> wish that I saw that, but oh, I wish it was even around back then. So anyway, oh, yes. so yes, I started to started to sing the Smurf song, and that's what got me back. So that's where I said that you know it's really, if we think about it, we're hardwired to look for danger, and the reality is that ninety nine point nine percent of the time there is no danger out there there's fear but there's no danger and so that's why i say fear is really an acronym for false education that appears real or false evidence that feels real yes. appears real yeah and i think that so many of us fear things that are probably never going to happen yes and, and in your situation that is exactly the case because you got back mm -hmm. you i got, got back to the boat. <laughs> I got back to the boat. Yes. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that I got back to the boat. And this was just an example of all of the fear and experiences that I had on that eight week course. So those are just three examples. And I could tell you many more, but those are the three we would be here all night. Um, and I have to say that I failed a lot on this course. Um, and I say this as I, you know, I failed and I failed and I failed on this course and yet I succeeded. Right. So the cool thing is, is that I did become Atlantic Canada's very first female military scuba diver. And I did fail a lot doing that. The interesting thing was, and this is in retrospect, is that this course was set up to create, to, to see how we would uh, create from failure. And the people that noticed and realized this were the ones that were resilient, um, that were able to bounce forward and were able to kind of realize that um, we can still make it to, uh, we still can go through fear and still get to where we want to be. 
And, and I think that's what the really important thing is, is that, you know, if we, if we allow fear to get in the way of where we're, you know, what we've always wanted to do with our life, where would we be? Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I said is that I did, uh, I did a keynote last, last year when I was talking about this particular story and I did the math and I said, you know, if I was to do the math about how many weeks I did this course to how many weeks I, you know, I've lived on this world from the time I took the course to this keynote, this course represented 0.48% of my life. So 0.48% of grueling 300 push-ups a day, 10 kilometer runs a day, um, two kilometer swims a day, weight belts, jaws, seals, you know, right. no such thing as finding Nemo. Um, <laughs> yes. And if I chose to listen, if I chose to do, to listen to my yes buts, if I chose to, you know, listen to the fears, to, to the false education that appears real, I never would have gone on the, on the trajectory that I did. And what is so cool is that because of this course, I started to go to the gym to work out because I was pretty petite at the time. And I started to realize this is pretty cool. Like I love being able to sculpt the body and build the body. And I got into physique competitions. And then at age 54, I ranked number seven in the world in my sport. And it's amazing. Of the, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool when I think about it. And, and because of this course and going to the gym, I ended up meeting the man that I ended up marrying. And now we have two amazing children um, or adults now, I guess. And because of this course and because of the sport that I did, I ended up getting a job with a Fortune 100 company. And because I was able to tell them the stories about resiliency and determination and grit and, you know, and resiliency. And certainly wasn't because of my marks in university, I can tell you that. And anyway, and then all that turned out to, I've got all of these skill sets and I want to start giving that to women and organizations and businesses. And so, and so then, and now I have my own business called uh, Champion Foundational Change Agency, where this is exactly what I do. I go into organizations and I talk to businesses of all sizes and I talk to women and I talk to people that are, are champions in their own right. And all they need is just, you know, someone to believe in them and someone just a couple of little aha moments to help them realize that they too can be the champion they've always been always been meant to be mm -hmm. and you know whether it's becoming a you know atlanta canada's second female military scuba <laughs> diver or you know being a nova scotia strong um person or whatever it is that the passion is there it's just how do you bring it out um, so yeah, so, you know, I would say start getting uncomfortable, start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's really, I mean, we will never reach our goals if we stay in our comfort zone. And what I actually call it, um, the, a lot of the women that I work with are in difficult family situations or marriages, mm -hmm. relationships, or maybe just in a job they really don't like. And I don't like to call it a comfort zone for those situations because I know yeah. when I was in a very abusive relationship, it wasn't comfortable. Nothing yeah. was comfortable about it, but it was familiar. So right. I call it the familiar zone because when we live in that familiar zone, we don't grow. We, we don't live our best life mm -hmm. and we do tend to live in those fears. And I did for almost 10 years with my first husband when he threatened to shoot me, if I ever drove mm -hmm. out the driveway and left him, he threatened to shoot me in the head. Right, and I right. believed him. Obviously, yeah. I left him 14 years ago. He didn't shoot me in the head. Right. But so many of us are manipulated by other people's voices. And yeah. I know that's how I live my life. And we let those voices control us. So mm -hmm. you, I'm like so proud of you that you learned so young to not listen to those voices and to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just think, you know, to get through our fears, yeah. we, we have to, we have to, to live our best life. And you and I are both proof of that. And the guest I had last week, also mm -hmm. uh, Colleen Cole, 
lived through hell and has an amazing life. And that's what I say about me. Um, I tell a lot of really vulnerable stories in my social media, but I don't tell them for anyone to feel bad for me. I don't, no one should ever feel bad for me. I have an amazing life. And I tell them because I know there are other people out there who are struggling with the same things I lived through. Yeah. And I know yeah. there are other people out there who are feeling claustrophobic and scared to jump in that chamber mm -hmm. um, to use the analogy that you use. So I love that you talk about fearing less Yeah, because we will never be 100% fearless in any situation we ever do. Fearless is not a thing. Yeah. And perfect is not a thing. No, and I love that you say that. And um, I know you yeah. do talk a bit about it. Yeah, uh, because I know you talk a little bit about being perfectly imperfect. So do you want to talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. And, and thank you for that, because I, I'm a real uh, talk about passion. And, you know, I, I love that the stories that you're that you're presenting and, and talking to people about and and in talking about um, that and I'll, I'll segue into the perfect imperfection. My, here's my my outlook on this is that, you know, first of all, a lot of adversity creates a lot of character and going through what you've gone through and so many women out there have gone through takes so much courage. And I was at a, uh, a women's networking event and I think you were there, Karen, and someone had talked about how do you, how does one become confident? And mm -hmm. I, and I actually uh, came up with the thought is like, what is it? What if we were to not strive for confidence? What if we were to strive for courage? And I think that is what you've demonstrated in your examples is that this is not this is not to say that I'm confident going through, you know, um, these relationships and going and, and leaving these relationships. It, it took courage to do this. And so adding that to perfect imperfection, you know, we there's a lot of us um, that wait until the perfect time or the perfect situation or, you know, just when I when I lose ten pounds, or when my hair, as as you can see, I'm embracing the gray, the COVID gray. <laughs> <Looks And>, great. <laughs> thank you. Does it look gray or great? It's a great gray. Great right. with yeah. a T. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and it's just, I guess, my point is, is that what pressure are we putting on ourselves for perfection, and is there any such thing? And what is perfect? And then what? Then what? Like, if there was perfection, then what? Right. <laughs> you know, so what would it be like? And this is what I, I say to a lot of the, when I do workshops, it's like, what would it be like if you were to embrace perfect imperfection? What does that give you permission to do? And what does that give you permission to be? And the interesting thing is the feedback that I get is like, oh, my God, it'd be like such a relief. It'd be like a whole weight coming off my shoulders. It's like, OK, well, what what would it look like or what would it feel like if you were to be perfectly imperfect? And people would it's it's incredible how people start to say, well, I would be this and I would do that. And and the creativity and almost like this childlike thought process would, would show up. And I'm thinking that is you. That is authentically yes. you. So what is the shield or the, the, the barrier that is created around around you that's stopping you? It's like, well, I have to be perfect. Well, says who, right? And who is who defines perfect? And, and who I, defines perfect? Yeah, exactly. Th that goes back to what I said earlier about the voices we hear in our heads are usually not our voices. They are voices yeah. of other people who have said, because at about, I don't know, 10, 12 years old, women especially start hearing the messages of you have to be skinny, you have to be this, you have to be that, and you don't, you have to be you. Yeah. And that's where so many of us get programmed to not be ourselves and to not love ourselves. And one of the things that I talk about in my keynote, one of my keynotes is my journey with trying to love myself because mm -hmm. I didn't realize that I didn't love myself until somebody told me that I didn't. And yeah. it was a life coach that I had signed up because I knew I needed some help. And she gave me a postcard and I still have it in my bathroom, but she challenged me to read it out loud every day in the mirror. 
And it took me two years to be able to do it. And I think I tell the story every week on the show. But the the card said simple words. It just said, I deeply and completely love myself. Mm -hmm. And I could not say that out loud. And I bet you there are women watching right now who could not go look themselves in the mirror and say that. Yeah. And it took me two years before I could do that without crying. Like some days I just couldn't even make the words come out. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror because I never looked at myself in the mirror because I didn't like what I saw in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And now, as you can see, I can say it and mean it. And I think that is just such a challenge for so many people. And I don't think it's only women. I think there are men that feel it too. Yeah. Um, but we really just have to love ourselves for who we are. And one thing that I love that uh, Rachel Hollis has said a lot, and I don't know if she originated it or other people did, but other people's opinions of you are none of your business. Yes, I love that. Yes. And it's that's how we have to think in order to be our best selves and live our best lives. Yeah. And and I know it's hard. I know yeah. it's really hard. And I should tell you too that, you know, uh, the the story that I have here sounds like I came to the realization at such a young age. And I have to say that there's one of the things that I do do, what I do do is um, I talk about, you know, this all sounds great and here's the other side. And then right. I also talk about the adversities. I talk about the depression and the anxiety and the emotional um, trauma and so many other things that I have experienced in my life that created, um, you know, to you probably would have this too, you know, PTSD. And all of these things that, you know, the triggers were just never understood them until, again, I can see the evolution of, of it all. Um, in retrospect, I just, it was, it was normal. It was my normal, just like this was your normal. Um, and it's interesting what you said about a coach and everything. And I can almost to a T tell you that that's exactly what we went through too. The words were different. However, the feeling was the same that, you know, I had this, everything would just come right there and I could, it, nothing would come out. And I ended mm -hmm. up taking six months off work. Um, and I kind of, I called it my spiritual awakening versus my mental breakdown. <laughs> Right. And it was, and I have to say, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it was almost like the shedding of of stuff that I needed to shed the weight of not being who I was, not being my authentic self, not being, you know, feeling like I should be, and the shame and everything that was going through my head of, again, trying to be somebody that I just wasn't, um, and. Like I said, that that was a that was six months of laying on the couch and just sitting there in silence and allowing myself just to be. And I'll tell you, that was again the best thing that ever happened. And that, that was another reason why I I when I was in when I was off for six months, I called my HR manager who was a friend of mine, and I said to her, I said, "Listen, if a retirement package comes up, I'm raising my hand." and 30 years with one company ever since university and, you know, um, financial security, company car, you know, benefits, everything. And then just to, you know, basically walk away from it at 50, what was I, 52. Uh, and it was the best thing that I ever did. Just took a while to get there. And it, and that's okay. And I, what was coming into my mind as you were talking is, we all need to realize that it's okay to be okay. Yes. It's because okay there's a lot okay. of days that we are not okay. Yeah. But the, the way that we become okay with all of it is by talking about it. If that's how you handle things. I'm a talker. I need to talk things out. Some people journal them. But it's important to acknowledge that you're not okay. Right. Not to not to hide it, not to try to keep those feelings in because you can't get past them without acknowledging them. So mm -hmm. like, congratulations to you. Good job to acknowledge it, to take the time that you needed. And we mm -hmm. all have to do that. And it, there's nothing to be ashamed of by taking the time, whether you call it a mental breakdown or a spiritual awakening, at the end of the day, 
it makes you better in it, a better yeah. you than you were before. Well, here's my thought is that if there is a word for it, we're not the only one that's going through it. So think of depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD, um, you know, sad, angry. You know, there are words in the, in the Oxford Dictionary for all of these things. And I'm thinking, and this is what came up for me. And I, I have a book, I just can't remember. I can never remember what it's called it's back there. Anyway, <laughs> and it talked all about, you know, all of these life traps that we go into. And it that was huge for me because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like, okay, first of all, this book they didn't just make for me, although it sounded like it was speaking just to Amory Flynn. And I'm kind of going, okay, mm -hmm. if it's a number one seller, I can't be the only one that bought this book. And if the, I'm not the only one that's bought this book, then I'm not the only one that's gone through it. And then that's what made me think, okay, if there's a word depression, if there's a word anxiety, then this is a pretty common word, which makes me again realize I'm not the only one going through it. So what is it about hiding these things that quite frankly, I believe that adversity is normal. And what is adversity? That's the character that is we that creates the character that, that is what creates our character. So can we be okay with not only expressing positive emotion, but is it okay to express that we're sad, that we're not okay? And what would again, being perfectly imperfect, what would that give permission to be and to to let go of? And I I love that too for anyone who's a parent who's watching is that it's okay to not be okay in front of our kids. And that yeah. was something that I struggled with as I went through my first divorce. My second marriage was a whole lot of hell. Um, mm. Ended with finding out my daughter was being sexually assaulted. And let me tell you, you never felt fear till you call community services on your, at the time, still my husband. Um, you know, that took more courage than I ever thought I had. Mm -hmm. And our life, despite all that, is amazing. My kids are amazing. That daughter went on to finish high school with high honors and $30,000 in scholarships and has put herself through school. And at 22 years old, her and a boyfriend just bought their first house. Oh my gosh, like, wow. It's, she's phenomenal. And I think a lot of it was because I was real with my kids. Yes. And we see so many kids right now who have mental health issues because there's so many pressures. And I think as parents, we are doing our kids a disservice if we are not real with them. Yeah. Because they need to see us be real. They need to see us see go through the hard times. They need to see us cry and they need to see us jump up and keep going. Yeah. And that's exactly what everyone has to do to get through the hard stuff is, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. And that's how I've always looked at it is, it's okay to not be okay, as long as you turn it into being okay. And the more tools you have in your toolbox to do that, the better. Yeah. And especially our kids these days, they need all the tools they can get. It's a hard world to live in for everybody. And um, as a mom, and I'm sure you felt it too, like you just, mm. you really, really have to prepare those kids to yeah. go out in this world. And whoever thought we'd be in the world we're in right now. Yeah. yeah. How do you even prepare? You can't. No. And this is where bouncing forward is so important. And, you know, how do we, do we see ourselves as victim to this uh, situation that is not within our control or how do we create from this situation? And that is again, a, a, a real important mind shift. Um, and because we're all going through it. This is again, outside of our circle of control. What is within our circle of control is how we can create or how we become victim to it. And that's a choice that we have. And I don't say that, I don't say that lightly, that choices are, there's choices that we make every day. It doesn't necessarily mean those choices are easy, yet those are choices that we can still create um, and not be victim to. Uh, just kind of like what you went through. I mean, you you know went through going through the the situations that you did. You know, you you did make a choice. It doesn't mean it was an easy choice. 
yet you did do it. And I've always found that the things that have led to the biggest, best parts of my life have been the hardest choices I've had yeah, to make. Absolutely. Because I too left a job um, a year ago, um, which was a great job, didn't pay great, but it was, it was at a school. I worked with special needs kids. So as a single parent, it was very important for me to be home when my kids were home. So mm -hmm. that was the perfect job for me. It was two minutes from home. I was always home when my kids were home and perfect. But I chose to leave that job last year because I knew I had a bigger mission. Yeah. I had a bigger mission to help more people than the kids in that school. And that's when I started my coaching and started writing my book that I'm still working on because who knew writing a book was such a big project, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're a anyway, champ right there, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, so it's all about the tough choices. It yeah. really is. And if we don't make the tough choices, we don't get to live our best lives. And yeah. nothing about the, my adult life has been easy. Like mm -hmm. nothing. So and I, would, I have I would, an amazing life. Sorry. And I, would, so I was going to say, I would assume too that um, getting back to choices and making the tough choices that you've made and you know I've made and so many of the listeners I would imagine have made as well. And one thing that has been so important is the support team that you embrace, that you haven't within your circle of people. And this, I think, is it doesn't necessarily mean it's a lot of people, depending. I mean, there's extroverts and introverts. And, you know, it's just who are the people that we trust and who do we know that will be there? Uh, like Brene Brown, that's, you know, we're, we're over, you know, we're puking in the toilet that's going to hold your hair back. You know, who are right. those people that are um, going to be there for us with, through thick or thin? And we spend so much time trying to, you know, get the person on the bus that we don't know to like us. It's like, what about the people yeah. that love us unconditionally? What about those yeah. people? Are those the people that are within our circle? Those are the people that are going to help us with the tough choices. And I found my circle was not always people I knew. Yeah. Um, Brene Brown, you mentioned her, has been such an influence to me, has helped me through so many hard times. When I watched her documentary on Netflix, I cried. And mm -hmm. then I watched it a second time and cried again, even though I knew what she was going to say. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important to enlist people who maybe are celebrities or who are thought uh, leaders in yeah. whatever it is that we're going through. And I know both of us are coaches, but the most important investment I've ever made in getting through the tough times is in a coach. Yes. Um, that life coach that taught me to love myself was the first step. And my husbands were like, that's all woo woo and stupid. And, <laughs> and when I was married, there's no way in hell I would have been able to do that because they wouldn't let me and I let them control me. Right. So when I get out on my own, I made the choice to invest and it was $150. At the time, I thought that was a lot of money to give to somebody to be my coach. And now this year, um, I paid $20,000 to my business coach mm -hmm. to help me. And she helps with everything. Um, but, you know, that is a huge investment and it is worth every penny. Right. Because right. she has helped me through personal things. She has helped me through my business things. She has empowered me to be the person that I am, um, mm -hmm. the coaching and finding an expert, so valuable, I cannot stress. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, and I think that, you know, you and I have been, uh, we both know like, you know, every, all, we're all naturally creative, resourceful and whole. We have the answers already within us. And as we talked about, you know, over, over the years, we kind of start giving up little pieces of our authenticity just to hope that we're going to have some sort of love and that in other words it's conditional love versus unconditional love but it's 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 love how we see it as children and all we want is to be loved and if we are being um if for some reason the people that are most important to us whether it be family or friends or whatever you know just judges our level of authenticity we will either we'll hide it or we'll give some of that up to 
hopefully be somebody that will love us. And so over time, we still know that there's that inner child within us, that inner superhero that is that is going to be our authentic self. So all we need to do as coaches, I shouldn't say all we need to do, but what we do as coaches is that we bring out the authentic self of that person out. And, you know, we have lots of little tools now, toolbox to help bring that person out. But the people have, we they have everything that they need already within yes. them. And it's just like, how do we just pull it out? And, and, and you're right. Like when that, when that happens, it's like, Oh my God, like there it is, you know, that yeah. aha moment. And it's, 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 it's incredible. And it doesn't happen overnight. It didn't, it didn't take us overnight to get to being hiding our authenticity. And it's not going to take overnight to shed that inner critic. However, there is, you can do it. Anybody oh, can yeah. do it by help, like you said, with coaching. Yes, and with surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, yeah. The things I like to say is if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, yes, that's right. Because really, yeah. if you want to move forward with your life, you need to find the people who are already living the life that you want to live. Right. And then you need to hang out with them. And then to be inspired by that. Yes. Not intimidated. And and hang out with them, whether it just is online by listening to a podcast or reading their book or whatever, the more you surround yourself with that positive messaging, the more you are going mm -hmm. to absorb it, you, the more you're going to speak it, the more you're going to live it. Mm -hmm. And when somebody says, who does she think she is? Swagger, like right. do it. Yeah. Um, don't shrink. And, and that's, yeah. I've, I have so many friends. I have a funny story. I was at um, a pub night one night uh, locally, so knew everybody there. And there was this guy who was like flirting with all the single girls, but literally they're on either side of me and he's not even looking at me. And the next day, my girlfriend and I were going to Halifax and I said, he was like all over this girl and that girl, but he didn't even look at me like, is there something wrong with me? and she's like um and I said no no go ahead say it and she said well you just have this aura of like confidence about you when you're standing there and I think it intimidates men mm. and she goes maybe you could tone that down a little and I'm like no no <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so, hey um you know you can't like I said, yeah. I can't tone that down. That's who I am. And if they're intimidated by me, that's not a me problem. That is a them problem. You know, it's, and, it, yeah. So go ahead. Go. Okay. I was just going to say that in one of the life coaching courses that I took and, you know, we were being coached during these uh, courses. And one of the questions that was asked was, what is the one thing that you can't live with? You can't be with. And um and so i expressed what what mine was and the interesting thing is it came back to that's actually what i want more of so in order for me to because i wanted and at the time i used the word arrogance and not that i wanted i want to be more arrogant i just wanted more confidence yet what again we kind of go to this pendulum swing and we over exaggerate something that we do want so then it becomes well arrogance right well really what i was looking for is that i wanted more confidence and so anyway that was that was a huge aha moment for me because what's interesting is i'm just curious if maybe this 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 guy saw this amazing courage and confidence in you and what they really wanted was more of that yet they didn't know how to get it. So that was intimidating versus inspiring. So that's the other thing, again, the mind shift, like how do you get inspired by uh, someone's level of confidence or something that they, that you aspire to versus be intimidated by? And again, mm -hmm. just noticing it, am I intimidated? Okay, well, what is it that really intimidates me? Maybe it's something I really want more of. And if that's it, then how, do, what, how can I use that to be inspired? How can I be inspired by it versus intimidated by it? Yeah, and that's one thing I know women especially do is judge other women who appear confident yeah. and you know have that swagger. 
And it's something we really should admire in other women. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I've been guilty of the who does she think she is? Uh, <laughs> you know, I've, I've said it before, but I've changed that mindset now to go look at her. Like, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And um, a book that I actually just finished reading, it's Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And there's one chapter about that. Um, and there's a quote that I shared on my Facebook recently that it's, you know what? You the, the programming is to say, who does she think she is? Mm -hmm. But we need to change it to go, look at her go. Right, yeah. And how do we change uh, judging to curiosity? And what would that be like? You know, how do we yeah. be curious about a situation versus mm -hmm. judging it? And the judge is really, again, our inner critic or the saboteur or the gremlin, whatever we want to call it, that's showing up and protecting us from what we, this gremlin or inner critic is thinking is something of danger. Um, and that could be danger to ego. And mm -hmm. so it's like, how do we be curious about something versus judging it? And it is, again, just noticing it. And even just notice and name it. It's like, oh my God, I just realized I just judged this, this girl. And who does she think she is? It's like, oh my gosh, what's there to notice there? You know, what if I was curious about that, what would that be like? Um, and well, it, it's, a lot of that programming. Yeah, it is. And a lot of that programming comes from the way we were raised and, the, yeah. you know, things that our parents said when somebody walked by on the street mm -hmm. or, you know, being teenagers. And if you weren't the cool kid in school, then programming for our whole lives. But we need to reprogram to be mm -hmm. inspired and supportive and non judgmental and cheer people on. You know what? If somebody right. is successful, power to them. I love seeing other women, men, anybody mm -hmm. reach their goals, be successful, make millions, like do it and please teach me how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and I mean, I'm and sure you've got lots of great programs that you offer to. Uh, people and yeah. I know that um, I've got some programs that I'm going to be launching that's going to talk just about that like you know not how you're going to make millions but how do you become a champion in your own right and you know because you already are it's just how do you yes. notice it yeah and, and how, do, do how can you it? be with it yeah how do you feel it exactly and and I love that you said that because I know we only have so much time, but now I'm getting really passionate because I that's when I start using my fingers. And I know, me too. Yeah, this is like, oh, yeah. And so what's interesting is that sometimes there isn't a word for um, the our authenticity. We're, we have been trained to know what the judge says to us. You know, you're, you're this, you're that, self-care, can't do it. You know, everyone else is auctioning a mask on. So when people, when I say like, what's it like to be your own champion? They don't, they, a lot of people can't describe it. It's like, okay, great. What does it feel like? What's the energy that you have? What is like, do you, is there a color? If you were to think about the end of a, the perfect movie, what would the scene look like that you can see that champion, you know, you could watch it over and over and over again. And you know that that is the, that is the visual that, brings out the champion feeling that you have inside. And that sometimes helps to at least bring guidance towards that champion that is within them without having to put a label on it. Because that, that can be really difficult. You may have ex experienced that yes. too with your clients, yeah. And I mean, what I try to tell people is, if you imagined your very best life, yeah, what would you be doing? What would you be wearing? What would your purse look like? What would your car look like? What would your house look like? Mm -hmm. And you can have all that. Right. You can. Yeah. Um, it's just you need you need to find the tools that are already in you. Yeah. That you don't recognize because no one's ever taught you to recognize them. No one's ever pointed them out to you. And that's I love when you see the light bulb go off for mm -hmm. a client to just and they're like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I've had so many wow moments in my life. And Doesn't that make I you feel like a millionaire right there? Just when you know that you're able to make a difference in someone's life. Yeah. And I'm not a millionaire, but I feel no. like I'm the richest person on the planet. Right. Like, I exactly. really do. Um, yeah. I, 
I'm able to have the things that I want. I have a beautiful home. I have my kids. And the fact that my kids are good humans is success to me, mm -hmm. whether if I never made another dime. Um, right. So it's about what you're passionate about. And, and one of the things I talk about in the Resilience Reboot is finding your why. Like, why do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. Because we don't do it to make money. Many of us. Nope. And Karen, I don't know if she's still there. She had some great words to say, though. <laughs> Her resiliency reboot is probably one of the best programs. I, I haven't seen it, although I can only imagine it's probably one of the best programs you'll ever uh, sign up for. And also, I'm going to be going to be um, launching a uh, champion transformation, and that's talking about transformation to become uh, the best you. And it really is about um, creating a positive mindset, champion mindset, uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And uh, you can see on the, the the front there on the screen is my new website, uh, www.changechamp.ca, and my company is called champion foundational change agency and i work again with individuals and organizations to transform mindset to the champion mindset um, for for people and organizations to become their best self um, just as a forewarning the change champ uh, website is still under construction however you can still get a hold of me at info um, at sorry info at changechamp.ca, it's a brand new email, info at changechamp.ca. And I'd be more than happy to give you more information about the uh, Champion Transformation Program that is going to be uh, launching probably, hopefully within the next week. Also, if anybody is in Windsor, Nova Scotia or lives close to Windsor, Nova Scotia, I'm going to be, along with two other women, we're gonna have a Women's Wisdom Weekend on August the 16th, and we will have more information on Eventbrite and on Facebook about that. And again, if anybody's looking for information, please contact me at info at changechamp.ca. And there she is again, yay! Hi, <laughs> I took over. Now because welcome to being in the country, my internet crashed. So <laughs> now I'm I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I know, thank you for covering. Um, yeah, uh, my internet completely crashed and I was like, what do I do now? So here <laughs> I am on my cell phone. <laughs> Great. Um, so we are almost done anyway. Um, and I want to thank you for coming on tonight and sharing all your valuable messages. And I just heard the end of it, but I think you just uh, put up, uh, talked about how to get in touch with you. Yep. And I also just talked a little bit more about your resiliency programs. So it's probably one of the best programs you can, you can that you can find in this area. And so I really encourage people to check you out. And Thank you. also talked a little bit about my program that I'm going to be launching very soon as well. So Thank we have so resiliency much. and champions together. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And um, Anyone who wants to contact me, I saw Rebecca put your email address up, but my email address is pretty simple. It's hello at karendeanspeaks.com. And before we're done, I want to remind everybody about our awesome t-shirts. Um, the Nova Scotia Strong t-shirts are a fundraiser for the Stronger Together Nova Scotia Fund, which is managed by the Red Cross to help the families of the victims of the horrible mass shooting that happened in our province on April 18th and 19th. Uh, we have so far raised, thank you to people like Amory who have supported it. We have so far raised $90,000, as in $90,000 for the fund. Uh, we launched it two months ago today on April 23rd. My goal is to raise $100,000. Um, as you can see, it's my garage door behind me because my warehouse is in my garage. It's We're a little home-based business that I've been running for 10 years. And um, this is by far the most exciting thing I've ever done. So thank you to everyone who supported me. Thank you, Anne Marie, for coming on tonight. Um, thank you. It was really amazing. And I know that Rebecca has another show coming on right now. We're going overtime. So I want to say thank you to all the viewers. 
And uh, Rebecca will be letting you know who my guest will be next week. And thanks for watching. Bye-bye.